Hello to everybody who's watching. My name is Paul Fletcher. I'm Minister for Families and Social Services in the Australian Government. And I'm also the member for Bradfield, the uh, electorate on Sydney's North Shore that runs from Chatswood up to Hornsby. And uh, I have a lot of uh, constituents of Chinese background. So Chinese New Year, always a very big event. Coming soon. Person. Coming soon. <laughs> and I'll be at the uh, festivities that Willoughby Council always organises in the Chatswood Mall. So uh, I'm very proud of my strong Chinese representation in my electorate. Great. Um, Australia has one of the best welfare systems in the world. Could you please quickly share uh, some of your insights of our system here? Well, in Australia, we do have a very extensive and generous welfare system. Yeah. You know, we spend $176 billion a year on social services and welfare. That's over a third of the entire Commonwealth budget. But one of the things that is most important about our welfare system is that it's very tightly targeted. We try and spend that money on those who need it the most. So the vast majority uh, of that spending goes to people who are on lower incomes. Um, and of course, we also have uh, an age pension, which is available to anybody now over 65 and a half, and that age will rise to 67 over coming years. So we do have a generous welfare system, but it's also targeted so that the money goes to those who need it the most. Of course, um, your department, as you just mentioned, looks after families and support those who are in need of financial support. And I understand that it also provides settlement and centering services mm -hmm. for certain social groups and people in need, obviously. What are some of the um, main programs that could potentially benefit new migrants, in particular the most um, potentially? And what are some of the main programs that most of the new migrants are involved in? Well, uh, my department has responsibility for settlement services. Yeah. Uh, we work closely uh, with the Department of Home Affairs. Yeah. And in settlement services, what we try and do is provide services to support people who are new to Australia and who are adjusting yeah. to life in this country. We have a particular focus under settlement services on those who come in under the humanitarian program because they often come with very few resources. Uh, they may well not speak English, uh, they may have uh, little, very little money, and so there's a particular program there to support people who come in under our uh, humanitarian program, including refugees. But, of course, the bulk of our immigration program focuses on people with skills, and, of course, China is a major source of people coming to Australia. A significant proportion of our immigration program is now those from China, as well as uh, India, um, New Zealand, Britain, uh, other countries in Asia, countries all around the world, the Middle East. So we bring people from all around the world, but of course um, countries with large populations like China, like India, are quite significantly represented in our immigration program. The other thing I'd say is that my department is responsible for services which uh, support uh, Australians of all backgrounds, including Australians of Chinese background or backgrounds from other countries. So, for example, there's over 20,000 Australians of Chinese background who receive an age pension. Uh, the uh, Family Tax Benefit Part A mm -hmm. is a benefit that's available to people uh, of low and modest incomes uh, based upon having children of particular ages. So it's to support the family. Mm -hmm. Now, we all know that the family is very important. Uh, and, of course, there's a significant number of Australians of Chinese background who benefit from that, as do people uh, with families of, of every background. So what I'd say to you is we have specific programs yep. for people who have arrived in Australia from other countries, but, of course, Australians and residents of backgrounds from many countries around the world also benefit from our general programs. Of course. Uh, speaking of new migrants, as we just mentioned, uh, under the current new reform being proposed by the federal government, obviously um, there are news that are saying that the newly arrived migrants won't be able to access or claim some um, welfare up to four years mm. after their arrival in Australia. And it's been quite controversial within our community. Uh, what is your take on this issue? And what are some of the considerations the government had when introducing such policy? 
A couple of points to make. Firstly, we have had for quite some time a requirement that you need to be in Australia for at least two years yes. to qualify for most of the benefits available under our social services system, such as, for example, New Start, which is the benefit that you can get if you're not working and you're then looking for work. Uh, New Start is what's available to support you in that circumstance. But we've had a rule for a long time that you need to be in Australia for at least two years before you're eligible. What we've now done is extended that to four years. Uh, so it's the same principle, we've just simply somewhat increased the waiting period. It's important to understand that the majority of people who come to Australia from other countries do so under the skilled migration program, at least those who come in uh, uh, under a uh, long-term or permanent visa. And so these are people with good capacity to work, mm -hmm. and indeed one of the reasons they've been eligible to come to Australia is because of having good educational qualifications, uh, good English language skills, uh, being usually uh, relatively younger in life. So these are all things that give the Australian government confidence that they're people who will be able to work. And in fact, the performance of people who come to Australia on skilled visas is very good. They uh, get into work at a high rate and their unemployment rate is lower than the general population. Of so this was one reason why we felt that extending from two years to four years was not going to cause significant hardship because we're talking about a population that does very well in its uh, performance in obtaining and staying in work. Mm -hmm. It's important to, to mention that there will continue to be uh, some uh, capacity for what's called an emergency benefit of, if people are in uh, particularly needy circumstances. Um, and where people have come in on the humanitarian program, then uh, the waiting period does not apply for the reasons I talked about before. If you're coming to Australia because you're a refugee from a war-torn country, you probably um, don't have uh, money. Yep. You may very well not speak English. So our government's focus for your first few years in Australia is helping you learn English and uh, get yourself established. We certainly hope over time that even if you've come in under the humanitarian program, that over time you'll uh, be able to work and contribute to our economy and our society. And we do see that happening as well. Will you and the government consider to introduce other uh, financial support or welfare for those who are in uh, emergency needs of things? For example, uh, single income families. As you just mentioned, you said the government will be able to provide emergency welfare. Um, what is that like? How well, can people claim it if they want to? And is there any other services that people can um, get if they are in how can I say, a bad condition? Uh, what I'd say to you is we think we've got the balance right. So yeah. we did carefully study what would be the impact of moving from the two-year to the four-year qualification period. Mm -hmm. um, as I've mentioned, the majority of people coming in uh, are on skilled visas, very good capacity to work, and that's what we see in their performance. Another big group is uh, people who come in with existing family connections. That means they've got family resources they can draw on if uh, something goes badly wrong. But there will continue to be a capacity for people to apply for what's called an emergency benefit. Um, we don't expect the numbers will be very big, but there will re remain that capacity. And as I say, for those coming in uh, under the humanitarian program, uh, the waiting period has not applied in the past and is not going to apply in the future. So they always have an option of getting emergency uh, welfare if they want to, is that right? Well, there is that option. Yep. Um, there are some conditions that apply. We don't think there will be very many uh, who, who find themselves in that position for all the reasons I've talked about, but we have struck that balance. I understand that this reform is still being discussed and being introduced. Uh, when well, no, is it's, a... it's, it, well, it's gone through the parliament, okay. it's been legislated, and it uh, took effect from 1 January this year. So as a matter of law, it's in place. There's some administrative work we're continuing to do through Centrelink and other government agencies, uh, but in, it, it is now uh, in place and operational. Um, so anybody who gets a visa from and after 1 January uh, will face that four-year waiting period, um, subject to what I talked about before, that if you're under the humanitarian program, for example, 
then the waiting period does not apply. Got it. So besides the skilled migrants that you emphasized on mm. and uh, the refugees and some other migrants, mm. there are a lot of us Chinese who are holding parent visas because their, parent, uh, their yeah. kids are in Australia. Yeah. Uh, it's a big number of us who have it. However, they have been complaining that uh, they won't be able to claim any benefits after 10 years mm. uh, after they arrive in Australia. Uh, and they find it pretty unfair because they are paying more money for their visas at the same time. And some of them have been saying that the government is in fact selling off visas to the highest bidders in the market. Could you please um, comment on this issue? One of the principles of our social welfare system in Australia, and we're no different from many other countries, is that we have an age pension, yes. which applies, as I mentioned now, if you turn 65 and a half, you become eligible for it, uh, provided you don't have assets or income above uh, what's called the assets and income test. But uh, if you're not in that situation, you're eligible for the age pension. Now, the idea here is that you've worked in Australia and you've paid taxes and you've contributed um, towards our economy and our society. It would not really be fair if we were to say, well, you can live in another country until the age of 70, then come to Australia, and then we'll immediately pay you an age pension for 10 or 20 or 30 years. That wouldn't be fair to everybody in Australia today whose taxes are paying for that. So we do have special arrangements in the situation you've talked about, where somebody uh, is living in Australia um, and they want to bring elderly parents into the country. They might be uh, Chinese, um, and in my electorate, I certainly have plenty of people in that situation. Uh, they might be Korean, um, they might be South African. I have a lot of uh, South Africans in my electorate, um, people who might have arrived, uh, say, in their 20s or 30s. They've established themselves, got a family, got a career. They might now be in their 40s. Their parents are now perhaps in their 60s or 70s, and they're saying, we'd like to bring our parents into the country so that the family can be together, so that we know we're there to support them as they get older. So there are uh, processes that the Australian government has in place for that, but part of that is um, that there is not an eligibility for the age pension for quite a period of time, and that is a conscious choice that we've made. Mm -hmm. It's not fair to uh, the existing Australian taxpayers, and in that situation, we do say to a family, if we're going to give you a visa to bring your parents in, we need to be satisfied that the family has the resources to support those uh, uh, parents. Of course, together with those, their own resources, because people at that stage of life might very well be bringing uh, significant financial resources as well. Of course. Um, I understand that Australia, Australia's welfare system is very structured mm -hmm. and it brings benefits for those who are in need, uh, but also restricts people from um, ripping it off mm. at the same time. However, there are still people exploiting the system and living off welfare payments. How is the government planning on tackling this welfare fraud issue in the future? We do have a significant focus on welfare fraud because you're right. It's very important that there is welfare available there is support available for those who meet the conditions and who are entitled to receive it. At the same time, if you're not entitled to receive it, you shouldn't be receiving it, mm -hmm. and you're effectively ripping off Australian taxpayers. So we do take uh, uh, these measures seriously. We do require um, people to comply with the conditions. Uh, we have, for example, programs through um, Centrelink and the Department of Human Services where we ask people to uh, demonstrate that they met the conditions if they were receiving, for example, a new start or parenting payment or another benefit. Um, often there are conditions about how much income you're allowed to be earning through your employment to still be eligible to get a benefit. And so, for example, we have processes to ask people to provide copies of their uh, bank statements, and pay slips to be able to validate that if they say, well, you know, I was earning below the limit, um, uh, that that's actually true. So we do have those systems in place, and that is important um, because we've got to be fair to those who receive welfare and need that support. We've also got to be fair to the taxpayers who pay for it. As I said, $176 billion a year, that's a huge amount of money. Taxpayers are paying for it. 
then they're entitled to know that that money is going to the purposes it's intended for and that we have systems in place to detect and to prevent fraud. That's great. So on the topic of family, social uh, welfare and benefits, uh, what are some, is there anything else you would like to say to the 1.2 million Chinese in Australia? What I'd like to say is that our country, Australia, is one of the great immigrant nations of the world. The proportion of adult Australians born overseas uh, is around 27%. That's one of the highest proportions of any country in the world. Moreover, we're a very successful multicultural nation. We have built a strong cultural norm of mutual respect for people from many different countries. And that's because we have, over the years, seen how our country has been strengthened by bringing in people from all around the world, including, of course, China. And China is now one of the major sources of immigration to Australia. And, of course, uh, if, you, if you look at um, languages spoken at home, uh, you know, Mandarin is right up there, Cantonese is quite high as well. Uh, if you look at um, people's uh, backgrounds, the number of people uh, of Chinese background is substantial. In my electorate, according to the census, 19% of people report being of Chinese background. So that's a very significant part of our community. So Australia as a nation has prospered thanks to bringing in talented, hard-working people from around the, country, uh, around the world. And there's no doubt that our Chinese population, our Chinese-Australian population, uh, comprises lots of very hard-working, very successful people uh, who are making a great contribution to our nation. For sure. So, last one. Uh, the Chinese New York pig is just around the corner. Mm. It's the week after, I believe. Um, could you please send your greetings to our Chinese uh, community here in Australia? Well, let me wish everybody. A, <laughs> let me wish everybody a very happy year of the pig. Uh, Chinese New Year is a great time for celebration, to uh, be with your family, uh, and to reflect on uh, all of your uh, all of the things in your life that you value. So, may I wish everybody a very happy, prosperous, and successful year of the pig. <laughs>